Good morning, folks. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bentley Pasco. I'm from the Seattle area. I'm a member of the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. And uh, you, you might want to know, why the heck is this random guy speaking at this fish convention? He's not a scientist. He's not a doctor. What the hell is he here for? Well, let's make that easy. Well, that looks way smaller. That makes it hard. OK, we'll make this easy. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a member of the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. I've completed Greater Seattle Aquarium Society's Master Aquatic Horticulture program 10 times. I am the highest point earner, whatever you want to call it, in Greater Seattle Aquarium Society's history, which they've been around since the early 70s. I grow a lot of plants. I'm not here to talk to you about plants. I run a YouTube channel. It's under my same name. I'm not very inventive. I'm really known for rainbow fish, plants, and one species of guppy. I'm not going to talk to you about any of those things. So one might wonder, why? Again, I mentioned, I'm not a scientist. Uh, I came back to the aquarium hobby in 2016, but I've been in the aquarium hobby in general my whole life. My family has kept fish since the 1950s. My great grandmother used to breed angelfish back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So fish has kind of been in the blood for a long time. I'm here to talk to you about something very, very special. And yet, we probably see them in every fish store we go to. I want to tell you a story about how I fell in love with a fish that farts. <laughs> this is Miscurnus angulocaudatus, AKA the dojo loach, the weather loach, or the pond loach. Now, weather loach and pond loach, I understand where those nicknames came from. I'm not a scientist. I didn't research why they call it a dojo loach. I just know that's what they call it in most stores. That's right. This is the level you're going to get out of this presentation. This picture is of my recently passed adopted fish, Danger Noodle. Let's talk about this fish. I used to sell plants before I got super busy with work through like Craigslist and OfferUp. It was my side hustle. I was all about plants for profit. This is a great thing. Get a random message on my phone at 10 p.m. at night from a guy going, hey, can you please help me? My 75 gallon tank cracked. And I, I messaged back and I was like, I forgot I even had this post up, man. Uh, what's up? <laughs> and it's like, so I have some fish and some plants. Can, are, are you, it says you're in Kent, which is where I live, Kent, South Seattle. I'm in Tacoma. Can you come and pick up my fish so they don't die? I was like, well, what do you have? Because they might not live with what I have. And he's like, oh, I've got some white clouds and a dojo loach and like two random tetras. I'm like, OK, uh, give me your address. I'll come out. So I go out to this guy's place with a couple of five gallon buckets. And he basically hands me a, a small army of really unhealthy java fern and this six inch pink noodle and like 10 white clouds. Take it home. I've got a 75 gallon long tank that I put it in and I'm just like, well, I don't know, I'll figure something out. Maybe I'll find somebody that actually cares for this fish and likes it and it can go to somebody who will appreciate the fish. My girlfriend comes over the next day what is this thing? And I was like, what? She's like this thing with the tentacles on its face that kind of looks like a giant uh, um, appendage. <laughs> I, oh, yes, the Cthulhu-faced pea monster. Got you. Um, that's called a dojo loach, dear. Like, what? Is it a, like an eel? Like, oh, no, it's not an eel. Oh. Where did it come from? So I tell her the story. She's like, that's really sweet. So we're doing some stuff, and eventually we're like watching TV, and she notices air bubbles come out of the fish. And she's instantly afraid. I've never looked into dojo loaches. So I look it up and find out a uh, fish farts. So let's talk about why. Some fun facts about the dojo loach. They're nicknamed the weather loach 
because they can feel shifts in barometric pressure, which means that when storms are coming, they can sense it. And they'll do weird things like stand completely vertical in a water system or go up toward the surface or down to hide away from the surface, depending on what they know is coming. Kind of neat, right? They can survive out of water for an exceptionally long period of time. You will find all sorts of horror and or miracle stories, depending on how you want to take your point of view, of people whose dojo loach jumped out of their tank, and hours later they put it back in water and it survived. Or, maybe more scarily, you'll find places where people have let their dojo loses loose into a local water system, and they've crawled across hundreds of feet of dirt into the next pond, and the next pond, and the next pond. Please don't release your noodles into the wild. They can survive dang near anywhere. And uh, they'll survive for a while. Typically in captivity, they'll live anywhere between seven and 10 years if you take decent care of them. In the wild, they can live significantly longer. A lot like many loaches, they actually have a surprisingly long lifespan. Now, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are mistaken for an eel. They're kind of a giant tube. Note these two tubes right here. These are two members of what I call Team Thick, which is three other dojo loaches I adopted later because my girlfriend loves them so much. And now I will probably have this fish for an eternity because my lady loves this fish. Uh, I mentioned how they can get around, they can move places to places. They'll use their pectoral fins and military crawl everywhere. Sometimes you'll see them swim and it looks funny because they're this giant noodle thing whipping around all over the place like they've got some kind of muscular problem. They'll dig into substrate, it helps them alleviate stress. They like sand, but they'll do it in aqua soil. Just don't give them sharp gravel. That's kind of mean, that's not nice. They want to dig, don't cut them up. And finally, the fun part, why they fart. We don't exactly know why. We don't know the full science behind it. But what we do know is that they can gather air from the atmosphere and their intestinal tract can absorb oxygen like their gills would. What the... This is, this is the, one of the best parts about this fish. So randomly, you'll see this thing floating one way or another because it has too much gas in one part of its body. And eventually you get to watch this fun thing where it will fart for you. And if you're like me, and you run a YouTube channel, they'll never do it when you want them to. But you'll be shooting a video like this. And uh, that happens in the background, out of focus. A little extra bubble for, for good measure. But when you're watching it, it becomes one of the most hilarious parts of your day. It's one of the best parts of my girlfriend's day, constantly throughout the day, because they do it all day, every day. And they'll keep going back for more air no matter how many times they fart it out. It's pretty hilarious. And it's part of why I've fallen in love with this dumb fish. Let's talk about the basics. How do we keep these fish successfully? They typically reach about six inches in captivity, although I know a friend of mine over here has one that is much larger than that. If you give them enough space, they can grow upwards of about a foot. But six inches are more likely to expect. They will get pretty big though. Uh, they, they put on some chunk if you feed them well. Generally, you wanna give them at least a 55 gallon tank. If you can spare a 75, a 125, if you're one of those luxurious people who's got a 180 or 240, they'll love you forever. And they'll be giant silly noodles in that big thing and they'll swim all over the place. They do like some swim space, but they don't necessarily need like high flow or anything too crazy. They can accept a very wide range of temperatures. Uh, kind of the established stuff out there is anywhere between 50 and 82 degrees Fahrenheit. That sounds a little crazy, right? I wouldn't keep them super hot personally. Uh, try and target something like 68 to 74, it's a nice wide range. So low tropical, you will, the, the warmer you go while they tolerate it, they're more likely to have a much shorter lifespan than that seven to 10 years. 
They really are a cool water fish in the grand scheme of things, but they can handle some lower levels of tropical temperatures. I keep mine about 74 degrees, just a heads up. They do pretty well on it. pH, 6.5 to 8. They'll take dang near anything you give them. The wild, soft water, a well that's liquid rock. They kind of don't care. Kind of nice. They're very flexible. Hardnesses anywhere from, I, I, would, I would even say 5 dKH is like actually a lie. They could probably go all the way down to like 2. But just change your water a lot or your pH will crash at that level. <laughs> right? So pretty simple. Keep them in basically fresh, clean water. And they're going to be happy at almost anything. They're very, very flexible fish. They're a bottom feeder. But don't let that fool you. They can breathe atmospheric oxygen. So they'll go to the surface for stuff if you put in flakes and they're hungry and smell it. They'll go for food anywhere. But if you want to make it easy on them, give them something that's toward the bottom. They are omnivorous, but give them a slightly more veg-heavy diet, or you can run into some bloating issues that will cause them to float really funny and probably, like me, scare the dickens out of you because it's the first time you've seen it float completely upside down for a few hours because it ate too much protein for a week straight because it's fought your rainbow fish for food because they're, they're little piggies and they love their food just like rainbow fish. They have nigh bottomless stomachs. Um, and the last thing, they'll jump. Remember how we said that whole thing about barometric pressure and weather and they can jump out of water and cry, crawl from pond to pond? Use a lid. Otherwise, you might be one of those horror stories. I found my loach on the ground. I put it in the water. Somehow it lived. I got lucky. But you don't want to get that horror story in the first place. Trust me, you'll fall in love with these silly, stupid noodles. Again, here's my good friend Danger Noodle hiding in plants. They actually surprisingly love plant tanks because they like to hide and hide a lot. And yet, when they're happy, they'll be everywhere and you'll never miss them. This picture probably requires some context. See Danger Noodle up here in the corner? And a Gordon Ramsay TV show. Let me tell you the other reason why my lady and me eventually fell in love with this fish. They're very curious. They want to know what's going on. They like to be touched. You can literally handhold them. They'll, anytime you get your arm in the tank, you're going to feel those Cthulhu noodles all over your forearm. It's tickles and is adorable all at the same time. But if your do dojo loaches are anything like mine, they'll watch TV with you. They will see some kind of blurry thing. Their eyesight's not that great, but they see something happening over here, and they're curious what it is. Uh, Danger Nula was a particular fan of Gordon Ramsay. We could put Gordon Ramsay shows on, something my girlfriend loves quite a lot, and Danger Nula would sit like this in the plants, pointed at the TV the entire time it was on. And then he would switch to something else, and Danger Nula would swim away. Gordon Ramsay's back on the television, pointed at the TV. Can you find out why I'm starting to fall in love with this silly fish? Despite the fact being a person who's mostly known for keeping rainbow fish in almost every other tank I own. They're just adorably weird. They like to hide. They like caves. They like plants. But if you give them things like java fern, they're going to do what Danger Noodle's doing. They're just going to hammock in it because they think they're hidden. But they're so curious they want to see what you're doing anyway. And it makes for a very, very entertaining experience watching these noodles slither through all sorts of plants, thinking they're hidden, despite the fact that this giant tube is nigh impossible to hide in a tank. Remember what I told you about lids? My secret to success has been keep my water level lower. So instead of filling my tank quite as high as I normally would, I leave about a three to four inch gap between the top of my tank and the top of my water level on average. They actually like getting that atmospheric air. So if you give them more space, I would still use a lid anyway. They're surprisingly good jumpers. They'll come up, they'll have room to get air, and they're less likely to try to jump out of your tank. So give them a little bit of space at the top of your tank. Don't feed too much protein, but also feed a fish that or feed fish foods that will get to them and other fish are less likely to pick on. So if you're somebody like me who has rainbow fish, rainbow fish will always strike top water very, very fast, very, very quick. They're psychos. So get a good sinking food. Distract the other fish with that nice floating food. Put a sinking food over where your noodles are. 
works perfectly. They don't have to bully the other fish out of the way because they will when they get bigger. When they get bigger, they have this nice, huge, muscular body that they could just smack your other fish around, even though they're big, gentle giants. They're not really going to aggressively attack your fish. They're very big sweethearts, but they don't know any better and they're hungry. So they'll just kind of smack your fish around and they won't know what to do anymore. Last one, like a lot of fish, they love water changes. They like a decent amount of oxygen. So a little bit of water flow can go a long way, but you don't need something like a river system level of water flow. A good couple of sponge filters and maybe a power head will do good. Or in my case, I have a pretty toned down canister with a spray bar. And when I do a nice water change, they're super active. They love it because it mimics rainfall and they love rainfall. It's actually part of what triggers them how to spawn. So let's talk about that kind of stuff. And also more importantly, problems. I've learned a lot of these the hard way, which is to say, not knowing what I could deal with, seeing a problem in one of my fish and panicking like crazy because they are nothing like rainbow fish and they act completely different. Dojo loaches have very small scales. For the most part, it actually feels more like a scaleless fish if you actually touch a dojo loach. If they're very healthy though, they have a very nice slime coat, they're very slimy. <laughs> So that makes them a little more susceptible to disease, a lot, a lot like most of our scaleless fish. So water quality becomes a big thing. Better water quality makes this a lot easier, but they can be very susceptible to things like ick. Annoying as can be, but easy to treat. They're very, very susceptible to ick. So just be prepared if you do ever decide like me to adopt a dojo loach out of somebody's cracked tank. Uh, Ick is a likely thing, especially with big temperature fluctuations. So just be prepared because it's really, really common in this fish, especially uh, compared to a lot of other diseases. But other bacteria can be more common too. They have a, what we call universally skinny disease, which is a parasitic infection. So if you notice that your noodle is getting kind of thin, you're probably going to start looking at some kind of parasite. It's surprisingly common in this fish. Uh, no matter how well they're eating, think of it like getting a tapeworm as a human. They're just, they could eat and eat and eat and eat. And if they have one of these parasites that are saying skinny, that's a clear sign. We need to start treating with some kind of antiparasitic. Um, they're very happy eaters. So if you know how to dose your fish food, especially makes it way easier. Bloating, floating. Uh, diets, like I mentioned before, if you give them too much protein, it can cause them to float completely upside down which will scare the heck out of you. Um, also, because they constantly are bringing in oxygen, you'll see them randomly floating a lot. So you kind of have to get used to how they float and what's the sign of, oh, we're about to fart versus, oh, some other problem is happening. Uh, you'll get used to it pretty quick, trust me. <laughs> if you, you watch these fish enough, it's very fast. But um, when they, when, if you are giving them too much protein and they start having issues maintaining their floats in the ways you're used to, like their whole body floats very flat. That's usually an indication of something that's more swim bladder related or some kind of too much protein plugging them up. Uh, the, the typical treating them like giving peas and things like that, they'll eat directly from your hands if they get used to your hands in the tank. So you can hand feed them mushed up peas. It's fantastic. Any of those high veget vegetative foods that will help push things through, very, very good for dojo loaches. And uh, the last one, they're difficult to breed, like really difficult, and yet not all at the same time. I'll teach you how in just a sec. Last thing, I mentioned about how curious they are. If you have young dojo loaches, you buy them at a store, they're usually like this. Make sure you don't have open exposed intakes to your filters. Have an, some, some kind of intake suppressant, whether it's a sponge or a, a really fine mesh or something that covers it because they will find their way into your canister filter if there's a big open tube they can crawl into. So just be prepared for that and you'll be all right. Let's talk about breeding these guys because it is possible, but a little, a little difficult. So here's the deal. They're really easy to sex. Male and female is very simple. So the top picture is a female, bottom picture is a male. And the easiest way is all in their pectoral fins. Males will get much more elongated kind of pointed, if you can see that in the picture there. Females get this much shorter, kind of rounded pectoral fin. In mature adult loaches, this is super easy to see. 
you'll have these big, long, kind of beautiful, almost wavy pectoral fins of the males, and these short little rounded ones on the females. You can spot it like that. It's very easy to tell male and female. Now here's the big problem. Because they're a big fish, you need a big tank. Typically 125 gallons or larger if you seriously want to spawn these things. Oh, remember how I said they're a cool water fish? Well, the way that they spawn is typically in spring. So you will need to get your tank cold, like 60 degrees, at least 65 if you're trying to stay warmer, but you probably need to keep them on their own or have very other cold water fish and get it to very cool temperatures for at least two months. You need to simulate winter. And then we're gonna simulate spring. We're gonna steadily bring that temperature up. We're gonna do lots of big water changes, so a bunch of 50% water changes to make it feel like lots of rainfall is happening and it's getting warm, it's getting warm. And that will trigger them to spawn. You wanna bring them up to about that 72, 74 range. Courting can take hours, literal hours for these fish to figure it out. But eventually the male kind of wraps around the female, not quite like a betta, but very similar. And you'll get clutches of roughly 50-ish eggs. Uh, some can be a lot larger. Now I've never tried to spawn mine because I keep rainbow fish and they don't like going that cold. But I've done some research because I was curious because my girlfriend was like, I want more of these. I was like, can I do this without spending a bunch of money? And the answer is kind of, but uh, from there, the, the big thing is this. The eggs typically hatch relatively fast between two and four days. The problem, they are teeny, teeny, tiny. You need infusoria, infusoria um, microworms, paramecium, you need all those super, super micro foods to feed them for the first little while. Uh, typically the first couple of weeks before they get to something more like baby brine shrimp in size. And realistically, live food is going to be your best friend when they're at this size. Uh, powdered food, something like Ceramicron or uh, something like the Rapashi powder straight, not necessarily all that great. So that's part of what makes these actually really difficult to breed. Now, the good news is if you just have a giant pond and you put them out there all year, they'll do it for you because <laughs> they'll have access to bugs and all that kind of lovely stuff. And then eventually uh, you can have the kind of fun that I have where no matter how many times you try to record them, they'll never do it on camera for you when you want. But when you don't want it and it's out of focus, they'll fart for you constantly. And you too can fall in love with a fish that farts. So finally, I wanted to go over very quickly, why keep a noodle? Well, don't keep one. They're very social. You will actually watch them rub up against each other. If one is sick, you will watch them massage against each other, trying to help the other dojo loach that's not doing well. It is heartbreaking to watch because if you know you're losing one, like I have recently, knowing that they're that social is heartbreaking and adorable at the same time. Adorable when they're all healthy, heartbreaking when you're dealing with an issue. They're extremely peaceful. These are gentle giants. Uh, you can, I've, like, I've got wine with a group of white clouds. The most they do is accidentally bump into some of my quarries, kind of scare my white clouds because they're just swimming through, but they never try to eat anything. They're a very, very peaceful fish. They can live in community tanks, assuming that you can keep them in a temperature range that's more optimal for them with the other fish in your tank. They love to interact with you. They're very curious. They like being touched. You can hand feed them. You can literally, um, there's a farm in Florida where they have touch tanks specifically. You just put your hand in like this and they'll slither all throughout your hands. They'll bring those noodle faces up to you and sit there and try to nibble on you and see what you taste like. It's, it's adorable, unless you're trying to pull a java fern out of a tank and then it tickles and you keep kind of doing this. That's what I was doing yesterday morning. <laughs> this mine kept going at my arms like crazy. They're goofy. They swim around. They look weird. They wiggle kind of funny when they swim. Uh, occasionally, I've never caught this on film, but one of the funniest things to watch is you'll see them come lay perfectly still on your substrate and then they'll start bouncing up and down like a small child 
in order to help themselves fart. And I, I call it the fart dance. I'm sure there is some scientific thing that they've described this behavior as. It's hysterical to watch this giant tube thing go <laughs> and just get a curtain of air coming out of them. It, it's one of those things that even non-aquarists, my girlfriend is a great example. Wasn't really into fish. Yeah, they're pretty. I could take a picture of them every once in a while. These things, oh no, 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 no. Now I have to, whenever I make space for it, have a giant tank full of just these for her so that she can play with the noodles. Even non-Aquarists will love these doofy things, especially when you get to watch them fart. And us seasoned veterans, diehards who want only one type of fish, whether you are a cichlid fan, a rainbow fish nerd, a live bearer expert, or you like those mean, nasty, predatorial, like South American monster fish, even you will fall in love with this fish that farts. Trust me, I did. You will too. And with that, questions. This is my, my group now. That's all of Team Thick hanging out. They do this all the time where one will put its head on the other. And they'll all cuddle up together in a little cuddle puddle. I, f I find it adorable. I, my girlfriend has like 8,000 pictures like this on her phone. Because anytime they do this, she loves it. Uh, I love these things so much, I put them on a fish towel for Fish to Overfest. This is the other picture here. But if you guys have any questions, uh, I can't promise that I will give you a good answer, but I'll give you some kind of answer. How long do you keep it? Seven to ten years, typically. Uh, especially if you keep them in that lower temperature range. If you can keep them in the very low 70s, like 70 to 72, or even that like 68 range, very common, seven to ten years. Are they all the same color, or is it different colors? Great question. There's actually quite a lot of color variety. So these ones are uh, basically an aquarium strain. Uh, they're commonly called a golden dojo loach, or you might see them as like melanistic, or maybe albino. They're not really true albinos. Mine, depending on the day, will look flesh colored or like a super red bristle nose. But you can get them to look yellow, pink, or um, one of the previous slides, the natural dojo loach, that the actual out in the wild is, there we go, more like this. They're kind of a brownish color with a speckled spot pattern. They're actually a very pretty fish. Uh, and they can also get less of spots and more like stripes too. Um, there's kind of two variations of the, the standard wild color. But honestly, the more that they've been bred in aquariums, you're getting a lot more strains coming from like melanistic bases and stuff like that to give you some interesting colors, but nothing too wild because they are just kind of a giant flesh noodle. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. You know, I'm, I'm not really sure if they are commercially produced in Florida. Uh, like I said, I'm not a scientist. I didn't dig this far. I just fell in love with this dumb fish and I decided for Fishtoberfest rather than talk about anything that I've known for, I would have fun. Uh, because there's plenty of far more scientific, lovely people here this weekend. And I'll let them do the actual educational things. Um, I'm just a dumb dumb on the internet. And I like having a little bit of fun every once in a while. Remember that part where I told you I'm not a scientist? No, uh, so <laughs> their, their, their native habitats are a lot of ponds in Asia. Uh, so actually, not terribly different from some of the, the water systems that we have in the Northwest. Granted, the, the actual plant life is significantly different of what's present, but they, they spend a lot of time in like muddy or sandy ponds. Really? Yeah, they eat them in Japan. They are eaten, just for my own personal recording, they breed them in Japan as a food source. They eat them alive? How dare they? I mean, I, I know that like eel is a big thing in Japan, but come on, these things are adorable. <laughs> Don't go to an H Mart and buy dojo loaches as a food source. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> oh, do they, do they actually sell them live at H-Mart? At 
Oh, but half the fun is growing them out. I mean, granted, I've, I've adopted all of mine at adult size, so who am I one to talk? But I guess, yeah. It's like a, there's a guy on YouTube that adopted the lobster out of a, out of a grocery store and like raised oh. him up and rehabilitated his yeah. claw and all those things. Some, someone can be a rescue ranger and rescue noodles from an H Mart and grow them up in an aquarium. <laughs> my girl, if I tell my girlfriend that, internet, I swear, don't tell her, because she'll send me that store every week. She finds that out. Uh, any other questions? Go ahead. Sure. So. They are pretty social. Um, they can survive solo and be just fine, but realistically, you'll want a group of like three plus. And if you're doing something, uh, I would say start at like a 55 gallon because they do get about six inches. They can get larger if you give them more space. If you put them in like a 125, you can get them upwards of a foot. I got a friend over there who's got one around that size. <laughs> uh, and the one, like some of the ones that I have in, in the pictures that I've shown, they're all about like eight inches or so. They spent most of their time in a 75 gallon. Uh, so you can get pretty decent size on them and they'll get about yay big around. I mean, they're, they're a fairly chunky fish. Um, but that being said, because they live for a long period of time, they, they grow not super fast, but they, they will get that size relatively quick. If you're feeding them well enough, that is. Go ahead. Oh, sure. So they will dig in substrates, so don't give them anything super sharp. Don't put them in, like, gravel. Um, but anything from finer sands to upwards of, like, I keep mine in just kind of your standard clay aqua soil. And they'll dig around in it a little bit. But anything smooth is really what it comes down to because they, they don't really have a ton of scales. You treat them more like a scaleless fish in the grand scheme of things, so you don't want anything sharp because it can injure them. Especially their barbels up front when they start digging around. Go ahead. You can keep them with goldfish. They'll be best friends. <laughs> Proof right here. I keep mine with rainbow fish. My rainbows still aren't sure whether they're like a predator or just some weird thing that floats around. They, they haven't figured it out quite yet. But rainbows are really dumb. So that's, that's probably the rainbow's fault and not necessarily the noodles. Any other questions? They can, but as if you keep enough distance between the top of the pond to where they could actually get to the surface and the water, they're, they're not going to, like, you know, do some kind of lift and pull themselves completely up. So if, you, if you've got the pond sunk down a little bit, you might be okay. So would they be okay in the winter? Depends on how cold it gets. But if you think about it, like, right, the deeper your water system is, it's going to get a little bit warmer down low. You're going to get some geothermal activity that helps protect them. They can go pretty cold. Um, there's a number of ponds where they have been set free into the wild yeah. in the Northwest, in the Seattle area. Uh, our, one of our speakers tomorrow, tomorrow, Alex Williamson, has found a number of them in several different ponds in the Seattle area. Uh, and they do just fine. <laughs> and you, you know how it is here or Seattle, we all get very similar weather. So it can get a little chilly, but usually not something like say Minnesota where it's yeah. Arctic. I just have more room in my backyard than in my house. Oh, sure, <laughs> sure. No, I mean, they, they do very, I mean, they're called upon the pond loach, right? They do very well in pond systems. Um, it's, it's very similar to koi, as long as it's not getting too hot and not getting completely frozen, yeah. they usually can find a way to survive. Anybody else? Oh, of course. Yes, Mr. Stephen P. No, I have them in a 75 gallon long right now. Uh, you could do a little bit smaller if you have a small group. But if you're trying to do a bigger group, which I will eventually get bullied into by my lady, uh, bigger is better. <laughs> You'd be fine. 
Yeah, that's that's more than enough space for two. Like I, I had at one point before I lost Danger Noodle, I had four in that 75 long, and they had plenty of room to run, and they were doing just fine. Like they, they don't get enormous, enormous, so you're not too stressed. Uh, but definitely don't try to keep like 15 in a 75. You know, that's going to be a little much. Uh, they're, they're much thicker than like a rope fish, so they do want a little bit of space. Yeah, um, they're really flexible. Surprisingly, they they can handle hard water, soft water, anywhere from like six point five to eight pH. But in general, what I would suggest is, if you're going to keep them with other tropical fish, try to target no more than about seventy four degrees Fahrenheit. You can go higher, but you don't want to do it long term because it will shorten their lifespan. Um, they really like typically to be cooler water, more like somewhere to 68 to 72, but 74 is fine, 75 is even okay. Um, just try to keep your water relatively clean in the grand scheme of things. It's like the common tropes for almost all tropical fish apply to the dojo loach. And the biggest reason why is, again, because they're basically effectively a scaleless fish, they're a little more susceptible to disease. So if you keep your water quality high, you don't ever have to worry about that. Um, but the only other thing that I, I didn't really mention is um, don't get scared when you see this weird, like, it looks like a fine mesh net and a giant cloud come out of your dojo loach. That's just them pooping. It looks really strange compared to what you're used to in normal fish. And you might worry, like, what is this weird pinkish white looking gelatinous thing in my tank? It's just their waste. They're a strange noodle thing and they do strange noodle things. Um, don't, don't get paranoid when you see that. I did the first time. I was like, what the f is that? What's happening to my fish? And then I started looking it up online. And I was like, oh, well, that's different. That's, these, these things get more Cthulhu-esque by the day. It's fantastic. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you all very, very much for listening to me ramble.